Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of the Pollination Podcast. Today, we're going to be discussing if the brood pattern is a reliable indicator of queen quality. I'm going to be going over a 2018 published study from the University of Minnesota and North Carolina State University that was published in Insects as a reference for this episode. So if you listen to my last episode, episode 11, where I was comparing raising queens in the mini mating nukes versus the five frame nukes, I actually brought up this study at the end of that episode, but there's so much really great information in it that I wanted to make a whole episode on the study itself, as well as my own experience. And this episode is still going to tie a little bit into last episode because what really kicked off my research into looking about queen quality based off a brood pattern was the fact that I was raising these queens in these mini styrofoam mating nukes. And a good friend of mine who used to buy queens from me just told me a while back that if I started raising queens in the mini mating nukes, he was no longer going to buy queens from me. He would only buy them if I raised them in larger five frame hives. And he told me that because he said there's just not a large enough laying area to determine if the queen is good quality enough in the, the mini mating nukes. And actually, I agreed with him right off the bat. I said, yeah, that is a downside of the minis. But we're running 200 of the mini styrofoam mating nukes now and several hundred of the five frame mating nukes. And I've got a pretty good point of comparison between the two. I've actually taken queens from both and examined them in larger hives over the course of the year and I've just seen no quality difference whatsoever. So it kind of made me think that maybe the brood pattern wasn't quite as important as we both originally thought. So I started doing more research and I came across this study and it has been really enlightening for me so I want to kind of break it down and share with you at least my understanding of the study and how it relates to determining a queen's quality based off her laying pattern. A queen honeybee is very important to the overall health and productivity of a colony. Generally speaking, the healthier a queen bee is, the more productive she is, and if you're running bees commercially, the more profitable she is. The more eggs that queen lays, the more nukes you can sell or packages you can shake, the more larvae you have to graft off to sell queens from, the stronger your colonies are going to be when pollination comes around, you're going to have more workers so you can get a larger honey crop. She really impacts everything about that hive. I've heard that in the wild, queen bees can live for up to five years or so, but I've never seen that, at least in my colonies. I find that queens generally live one to two, maybe three years at best. A common practice in commercial beekeeping and what we do here is we replace our queens every single year. Sometimes they get replaced every six months if the first queen is fizzling out a little bit. After a queen hatches from a queen cell, she will go on multiple mating flights and will acquire and store all the sperm that she's going to use throughout her entire lifetime. Typically, a queen will mate with about 10 to 20 drones. As a queen breeder, I try to create surplus drones in the area by having adjacent bee yards that are within the flight range of my mating nukes. And I use drone frames, those are the green plastic frames that only produce drones in those adjacent drone yards. So I make sure my queens are mating with as many drones as possible. That's about the best you can do when you're open mating, unless you're artificially inseminating your queens, and that's a whole different ball game. There's a lot of factors that are not in our control as beekeepers. I can saturate this area with a lot of drones, so I increase the likelihood that virgin queens will mate with more drones, but obviously I can't make her mate with any uh, particular amount. I can't help too much if the weather turns, especially down here in Florida. You know, they can be sunny, they can project good sunny weather tomorrow and it can be a hurricane. It just happens that fast. You can't even tell hardly 12 hours out sometimes with the weather here. And if you get bad weather, actually it can blow the queens off away, it can blow the drones away and that can really affect your mating. But one thing a lot of people don't talk about, and honestly it's really hard to know unless you're sending your queens off to get dissected and tested is that not only is it the amount of 
sperm that the queen stores from her mating flights, but it's also the viability of that sperm. It's not all about numbers. It's really about quality as well. There are drones that are just themselves infertile, like they have sperm, they're mating with the queens, they're injecting their sperm into the queen, but it's not viable. There is some sort of defect with the drone that can actually happen as well. And another thing a lot of people don't talk about is all that sperm the queen is storing up over those original mating flights is that it doesn't last forever. It just doesn't stay at 100% peak quality for the several years that queen is going to live for. Actually, the sperm quality will decrease over time. That's one reason when you see an older queen that you're likely to see supersedure cells because the workers know that the quality of the sperm is diminishing as well as the quantity as well. But usually it's both together that can trigger a poor laying pattern in a queen. Other issues that can cause a poor laying pattern are bacterial infections and viral infections. Obviously, every beekeeper in the world, I think at this point, is quite familiar with the Varroa destructor mite. And once you have a lot of mite issues, and here in Florida, it's usually peak season, is usually around summer, which is August or so for us, you're going to have a very spotty brood pattern because the larvae are just so sick that the bees are removing them from the cells. Another issue that can create spotty brood pattern that we have specifically, I know here in our area, is the fact that some plants produce a toxic nectar to the honeybees. There's a tree here called summer tai tai. I believe it's called white tai tai as well. It's actually a different species than the spring tai tai we have, which I believe is called black tai tai, which is very beneficial to the bees. The summer tai tai is really toxic. It causes a syndrome called purple brood where the larva will actually become purple. And if the larva are fed too much of that toxic nectar, they'll die. So we actually see a lot of spotty brood patterns right around this time of year, actually. I just drove down the road and I saw summer tai tai blooming all over the place. And we've had a lot of rain recently, which is going to cause it to produce a lot more nectar. So if I were to go check my hives right now and see a spotty brood pattern, I would not immediately think that uh, the queens are low quality. It's probably because the summer tai tai has bloomed and caused a lot of desiccation to the larva. There's some other simple issues that can just happen because the bees, although they're great insects and highly productive, they're not perfect. There are instances where the worker bees will fail to prepare a cell for the queen to lay in. They actually go down there and they polish it. They release a small pheromone in the bottom of the cell that tells the queen whether she should lay a fertilized or unfertilized egg. The queen herself can just overlook one of these cells that was prepared by the workers. Sometimes eggs just don't hatch because not every egg is perfect quality. Sometimes the egg hatches and the larva just doesn't make it for a variety of reasons that may have nothing to do with bacterial or fungal or poison. Perhaps there was just an issue with the internal development of the larva. These are just small issues that can cause a spotty brood pattern as well. If you have a queen that is inbred, that can also create a spotty brood pattern because a lot of the larva will not develop properly, so the bees will remove them. So these are just a few of the factors that I can think off the top of my head that would create a spotty brood pattern. There are probably some others I'm just not thinking of, but you can already see just right now there are so many variables that can affect the quality of a brood pattern of a queen that has almost nothing to do with the queen herself. There's so many outside factors. So the study was pretty straightforward. They covered most of the bases and a lot of the issues that I mentioned earlier that can cause poor brood patterns. They eliminated a lot of those factors. They had three primary objectives in this study, which were to determine if brood pattern was a reliable indicator of queen quality, to identify colony level measures associated with poor brood pattern, and to examine the change in brood pattern after the queens were exchanged into a colony with the opposite brood pattern. So they took queens that had a quote unquote bad brood pattern and they exchanged them with a queen from another hive that had a quote unquote good brood pattern. And they really established a metric for what they consider good patterns and, and poor patterns in the brood. And that was really fascinating to see the results of what happens when they exchanged a bad queen and a good queen and swap the two colonies. What was really interesting is that queens with a good pattern and queens with a bad pattern were almost 
completely indistinguishable in terms of sperm counts, their sperm viability, their body size, or weight. The bad queens weren't particularly smaller than the queens that were laying better. When they dissected the queens, they still had about the same amount of sperm that was stored. The study tested for bacterial and viral diseases like deformed winged virus or nosema, and all the bacterial and viral levels in a good hive and a bad hive were identical. They took a queen with a bad pattern and a queen with a good pattern, and they just swapped the hives that they were in. And surprisingly, the queen with a bad pattern actually increased in quality. It wasn't a night and day difference. I think it was somewhere in the realm of like 10 to 20% increase brood laying. And the queen that originally had a good laying pattern actually decreased in quality when she was moved to another hive that originally had a bad laying pattern. In fact, the good queen dropped somewhere in the realm of about 10% quality. In my opinion, that proves that even if you've eliminated a lot of factors like bacterial and viral and even poison, that might be in the hive. Because I did forget to mention earlier that some of the comb from both of the hives were removed and tested for different pesticides and herbicides that are commonly known to affect bees. And they were both found to be within the same levels of each other. So even when you've kind of taken all these factors out and you swap the two queens, and you see the good queen drops in quality and the bad queen goes up in quality, kind of leads you to believe it's not necessarily the queen that's causing the problems. That there's probably an environment in each colony specifically that is affecting the laying patterns of the queen. This means the worker bees probably contribute at least 10 to 20 percent of the quality towards a queen's laying pattern, at least based off from this small study. Now, the researchers do admit in the paper that there are some shortcomings with this study. They admit that they only allowed the queens to lay for 21 days when they did the exchange of the good queen and the bad queen. They think that if they had waited for longer, perhaps six weeks when the original generation of bees had died off from one queen and the new generation was taking over, they may have seen better results that would have helped them to identify whether it was truly the workers that were having a large impact or not, because at that point, the genetics have completely transferred over to the new queen that has been exchanged. And even though the comb toxicity levels started out at very similar levels between the two hives where the queens were exchanged, they did notice a trend of an increase in toxicity, I think from pesticide exposure, that was building up in one of the hives that had a poor brood pattern to begin with, and that continued to increase over time. So they think that might have also had something to do with laying pattern, but they really emphasize in the paper that there are so many variables to consider that it's just too hard to pinpoint one or two items. But they feel pretty confident in stating that judging a queen's quality based solely off her brood pattern without considering all the other factors that can affect a brood pattern is not a great metric for judging a queen. I'll close out here by just reading a paragraph that they put in the paper. Failure of the queen is often identified as a leading cause of honeybee colony mortality. However, the factors that contribute to queen failure are poorly defined and often misunderstood. We studied one specific sign attributed to queen failure, poor brood pattern. In 2016 and 2017, we identified pairs of colonies with good and poor brood patterns in commercial beekeeping operations and used standard metrics to assess queen and colony health. We found no queen quality measures reliably associated with poor brood colonies. In the second year, 2017, we exchanged queens between colony pairs for 21 days. A queen from a poor brood colony was introduced into a good brood colony and vice versa. We observed that brood patterns of queens originally from poor brood colonies significantly improved after placement into a good brood colony after 21 days, suggesting factors other than the queen contributed to brood pattern. Our study challenges the notion that brood pattern alone is sufficient to judge queen quality. Our results emphasize the challenges in determining the root source of problems related to the queen when assessing honeybee colony health. 
that's all for me, guys. I uh, hope you have a great day, and I'll talk to you on the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Pollination Podcast. I'm Matthew Walker from Walk in the Woods Apiary. We hope we have answered a few of your beekeeping and pollinator questions. Please share your questions and comments to our Facebook page at the Pollination Podcast.